Hello, I'm Alan Joaquin, and I'm with the Sons of History, and welcome to Tuesday Night History Live. I am changing the name to adding the word live to it, so that maybe it might thrill some of y'all even more. Uh, today, we are going to talk about a very, very controversial subject, uh, which really shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be, but with what has been going on in these last few days uh, with the death of uh, George Floyd, we, we feel like it's a good idea to discuss the looting, the riots, and the peaceful demonstrations and compare them to the Revolutionary War and the American Revolution. Um, this is why I'm wearing this shirt. This is a Sons of Liberty. Now, I'm with the Sons of History, so if I accidentally mix Sons of Liberty and Sons of History, uh, you'll have to forgive me on that part. But we kind of want to just ask the question, you know, what would the Sons of Liberty do in a situation such as what we have been seeing lately with uh, a lot of the p police brutality and how the uh, black population is reacting towards it. And, you know, we're, we're going to try to make it a little bit enjoyable because this is a very touchy subject. Um, so I, I do hope you enjoy this presentation. And if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to mention it on my page. Okay, now, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about the Bill of Rights. Now, before, and, and what's going to happen is that for the next several weeks, we're going to discuss uh, all 10 of the amendments. Now, today we're going to discuss part of the First Amendment. Uh, not the whole thing, because there's, it's, there's several parts to it, but we're going to concentrate today on the, um, like, the uh, right to peaceably assemble, uh, petition for grievances, freedom of uh, expression, freedom of speech. That's what we're going to cover today. Next week, we'll cover a little bit more on the religious aspect of it. Now, before we get started, uh, first, I want to um, suggest that everybody grab a drink. Now, for this occasion, I'm drinking a uh, Johnny Walker Black, you know, because the uh, subject matter at hand, my favorite... Uh, one of my favorite drinks. Anyway, um, I also want to dedicate this to my friend Marlene DeVia, who is in New Jersey right now. We call her the Jersey Tomato. She runs the, uh, the AMC Turn page. Uh, she is in the hospital, and she's been on a respirator for, for quite some time. And we're really pulling for you. Marlene, I hope you're watching, and uh, toast to you. Okay. You usually should get Johnny Walker Black. It's, it's some good stuff. Okay. Now... Before we get into the whole uh, First Amendment and with what's going on, we want to start off at the very beginning by stating that the whole notion that you should judge a person um, by the color of their skin or you might not like a person who is black, it's stupid. It's ignorant. And there, there's really, we're going to show you how ridiculous it is. Okay. Look at that beautiful face right there, Rihanna. I, I love the way, you know, I don't know her songs too well, but I've always been astonished at just how beautiful of a girl she is. Now, are you going to sit there and say she's not a beautiful woman simply because she has dark skin or she's black? No, that is stupid. Let's go to the next one. By the way, this is not the best device in the world, but it's all I have. Okay, beautiful, classy. That's Halle Berry. Come on. All right, next. We have Zoe Saldana, I think is her name. Beautiful girl from the Star Trek movie. Uh, I've just always been astonished at just how beautiful she is. I mean, look at her, beautiful. All right, ladies, I have Denzel Washington for you. Classy guy, love his acting, love his movies. And then you have Morgan Freeman. Now, who wouldn't want Morgan Freeman to narrate your life? Just, he's a class act. Now... You don't like black. Okay. Well, I guess, uh, all right, we're going to show you how ridiculous and stupid that can be. Black Hawk Down, one of my favorite movies. Can't watch it because it's got the word black in it. Yeah, that's how stupid not liking people because they're black. Uh, SR-71, nope, can't fly it. It's black. So, you know, yeah, I know I'm being dumb here, but okay. Black McLaren, sorry, can't have it. You're judging it by the color of its skin. Now, for me, I prefer the GT350 Shelby. 
That is my dream car, and if I ever get rich, that's the car I'm getting. And I don't care what color it is. Now, how can you look at this face and not go, oh, that's a... Are you going to judge a puppy because of the color of its skin? Are you going to say no to the Black American Express card? Yeah, come on. So, uh, let's see. Where are we going to next? And see, I told you this thing is weird. Okay, go to the next. All right, now, now we're going to get into the subject matter at hand. The First Amendment. Congress shall make no law. Oops, go back. See, I told you that this thing was uh, messed up. Well, we'll just... We'll stop here. See, this is the part I don't like. Okay, yeah, we're just going to stop it here. We'll pause it here until we get to it. The First Amendment states that, you know, that the uh, Congress shall establish no law respecting a religion. You have the freedom of the press, the freedom of speech, uh, freedom to assemble, expression, uh, freedom of grievances, to express grievances, petition grievances to the government. Um, that's all in the, in the First Amendment. Now, before we get into why the First Amendment was created and um, how it all came about, I do want to discuss a couple of things comparing to today and comparing to what happened in the 1770s. Now, I've heard a lot of people, after uh, George Floyd was killed, um, there's still going to be a determination. I'm, I'm just going to state by the way the courts are going to say it. Courts are going to determine whether it was murder or whether it was manslaughter. So for right now, we're just going to call it the killing of uh, George Floyd. There have been, there were some peaceful protesters. And then after the peaceful protesters, um, there were some riots. Now, some of these riots, based on what a lot of people are noticing, a lot of these riots and looting, mostly the riots at this point, the, they were out-of-towners. They were not people from the neighborhoods. They were the ones that were destroying buildings, destroying businesses, burning buildings. Um, there was, I believe there was a black firefighter who uh, spent all his money to uh, build a business and it was burned down. I think it was a, a bar or a restaurant. Now, many of those who were arrested were out-of-towners. They were not black people just burning down their own neighborhoods. My understanding is, is that there were a lot of black people who rightfully were protesting and demonstrating. It's their God-given right to demonstrate and to protest. And, the, you know, look, the more the better. There, there have been a lot of cases of police brutality, and we are going to discuss that. We're going to discuss also in the police brutality the number of white people, black people, brown people, everybody who has been who has been killed over the years, we do have some stats that, that shows this. Now, in much of the looting and in much of the, um, um, what do you call it? The, um, there, there's been a lot of looting and there have been um, a lot of anarchy that has been going on. There have been some people who've been stating, well, look, during the, during the American Revolution, we had uh, people um, who uh, destroyed the tea, the Boston Tea Party. Now, the Boston Tea Party is, is something that we're going to discuss. What I want to discuss first is, is that there was an incident that took place. Now, the son, who are the Sons of Liberty? This is the shirt that I'm wearing. Now, the Sons of Liberty were a group of men who lived in all 13 of the colonies. Um, they were protesting against many of the taxes that Parliament was imposing on the colonists. Now, taxes in those days, each of the colonies, they had their own taxes, and they were voted on by their own assemblies, by their own, kind of like, it it's, it'd be similar to having their own state legislatures. These were like colonial legislatures, like Virginia had the, had the House of Burgesses. The people would elect representatives, and the representatives would decide whether there should be any taxes. Well, after the Seven Years' War, also known as the French-Indian War, uh, Britain was uh, very much, they needed money. England needed money. So... They imposed taxes on the colonists. The colonists said, wait a minute, we don't have any representation in Parliament. Taxation of the representation is tyranny, and they resisted. And this continued for, uh, after, from 1765, and it continued all the way until we get to the Tea Act and the Boston Tea Party. Now, mercant mercantilism was a practice that all the European countries they were practicing it. 
um, what it meant was that the 13 colonies could only purchase items from England. If you were a French colony, you could only buy items from France. So the 13 colonies, the people who lived there, could only purchase items coming from London. Now, one of the big items was tea. Now, tea was, was the last um, tax that, was, that remained. Now, the reason why tea remained as part of a tax is because Parliament and King George III stated that it was their right to tax the colonists. So that's why they didn't get rid of the tax. They felt, look, you know, we're Parliament, we have the authority, and we're going to keep this just... It was kind of like in spite of what the colonists wanted, we're going to keep the tea tax, which was three pence per pound of tea. They kept it. Now, the colonists decided to um, get their tea from smugglers, mostly the Dutch. So there was a lot of smuggling going on during that time. Now, right here, now this is a picture of the Gatsby, which was a British schooner uh, going up in flames. By the way, there are going to be some cuss words used in this production, in this broadcast. We just felt that, okay, we won't make it too harsh of, uh, too harsh of a word, but it just feels right to call certain people, certain names, which is what we're going to do in this case. Okay, now, this is known as the Gatsby Affair. It happened in June of 1772. Again, there were taxes being imposed, and there were smugglers, a lot of smugglers. Now, in Rhode Island, there is a bay called Narragansett Bay. It kind of splits Rhode Island in two, and it's a uh, smuggler's paradise. Well, the British had um, a ship called the Gatsby, and it was captained by, a, or skippered by, a Lieutenant William Dudingston. Now, Lieutenant Dudingston, he was an asshole. Pardon my French. I know this is a family show, but I can't say it any nicer. He really was an asshole to everybody that he came across. Very ruthless. And one day in June of 1772, he was chasing a ship, and he grant he. He, the ship grounded in an area that today has the name Gatsby Point. It's on the west bank uh, of the Narragansett Bay. You can go there right now and see the area where the ship ran aground. So what happened was that a, a group of men, many of whom were with the Sons of Liberty in Rhode Island, rowed their boats to the Gatsby and decided to punish the perpetrators, in this case, Lieutenant Dudingston and his crew. Um, they boarded the ship. This is at night time. They boarded the ship. Lieutenant Dudingston was swinging his uh, sword at, at one of the uh, Sons of Liberty, and he ended up getting shot right in the groin. They evacuated him and his men, and they burned down the ship. Now, we're going to compare this to what's going on now in 2020, but later on. Okay, so that was the Gatsby Affair. Now, after that happened, that was it. There was no more retribution on any other um, British ships, on any uh, British sailors, redcoats, nothing. This was the only time. It's because this particular ship, the Gatsby, was a weapon against the people. And the people in Rhode Island had had enough, and they took matters into their own hands. The sheriff of, I believe it was Kent County, uh, his name was Whipple. Uh, yes, Abraham Whipple. Uh, he was the sheriff of Kent County, and he led, he led uh, him and a guy named John Brown, where Brown University comes from. They're the ones that torched the ship. Okay, now, after that, we're going to go to the Boston Tea Party. Now, the Boston Tea Party is kind of a complicated affair. Again, I'm seeing, let's say on Facebook and in social media, where people are justifying a lot of the looting and a lot of the destruction and, and uh, devastation that's taking place in many of our cities, saying, hey, if, the, if they could, Sons of Liberty can do it in the Boston Tea Party, then we can too. Not, not quite. And I'm going to explain why this is different and the circumstances and what really happened. Okay, now, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, the governor at the time of Massachusetts, his name was Thomas Hutchinson, um, he and his son-in-law, Andrew Oliver, um, I'm sorry, his brother-in-law, Andrew Oliver, were part of, the, they, were, they were ruling Massachusetts at the time. Now, there was a, there was a company called the, uh, the East India 
the East India Tea Company. Now, the East India Tea Company had a monopoly, and you've got to remember about the, the mercantilism that I was mentioning, where you could only buy English tea. The tea had to go to London, and then from there come to the colonies. Now, many of the colonists um, in, the other, um, in the other 13 colonies, they were rejecting the English tea. There was, there was a boycott. They weren't going to buy the tea unless they got rid of the tax. So people were buying smuggled Dutch tea. What the, what the East India Company decided to do was um, only certain people could, could um, uh, merchants could sell the tea. So in, I know this is kind of complicated. In Boston, there were five men, only five men who could sell the tea in Boston. Now, since that there was a monopoly, that meant that those five guys were the only five guys in Massachusetts who could sell any tea at all. All other tea was banned. Now, three of those people, three of those five agents, happened to be related to Thomas Hutchinson. Now, one of them was a son-in-law. So you can kind of see where it was not fair to other merchants who wanted to sell tea, but they couldn't because it was state-run. Only five, mer only five merchants could sell the East India tea, and that was the only tea that could be sold. All other teas were illegal. So, what happened was that there were three ships that sailed into Boston. Uh, the first one was called the Dartmouth, um, and then there were two more that uh, followed suit, the Eleanor and the Beaver. Now, the law was this. When a ship comes to Boston, they have to unload the tea within 20 days. When the tea is unloaded, and they have to be unloaded, if they're not unloaded, uh, Massachusetts could confiscate the cargo. But here's the deal. When the, when the tea is unloaded, they have to pay the tax. Well, the Bostonians were saying, we don't want the tea. You're forcing us to take this tea. You're forcing us to pay a tax for something that we did not consent to. So it was the government forcing the people to, to take the tea which they didn't want. So on December the 17th would have been the 20th day. So what they did was people like Sam Adams and Dr. Joseph Warren um, were, they'd approach uh, the owner of the Dartmouth, his name was Francis Roach, um, and, and told him, listen, go talk to Governor Hutchinson and tell him you want to leave Boston without unloading the tea. You're going to take the tea with you and head back to London. Francis Roach did try. He tried a couple times. Now, the last time was on December the 16th. <clears throat> so they had a meeting. The Sons of Liberty had a meeting at the Old, uh, at the old South um, the, um, the old South Meeting House. Yes, the Old South Meeting House. A lot of stats here. I have to kind of remember all of them. They met at the Old South Meeting House. Uh, Sam Adams was there, uh, Benjamin Church, Dr. Benjamin Church, who ended up becoming a traitor later on. Um, they were... They were there speaking to the people. The whole, there were about 7,000 people who were there. While they were meeting, around 3 o'clock, Francis Roach went to, go speak to the, uh, went to go speak to the governor, Hutchinson, and tell him that he wants to leave with the tea. Governor Hutchinson said, absolutely not. The tea's going to stay there, and you're going to unload it the very next day. So Francis Roach went back to the Old South Meeting House in Boston, now, this is around 6 o'clock, and explained to everybody in the crowd, sorry, we can't. Uh, for, he said, uh, Governor Hutchinson is not going to let me leave Boston, Port, the Boston Harbor with the cargo. I have to unload the cargo. Again, once the cargo is unloaded, then the, they, they tax the tea. So Sam Adams stepped up to the podium, looked at everybody, and said... <clears throat> This meeting can do nothing more to save the country. Now that was the signal. About 150 men dressed up as Mohawks. They ballyhooed, they hollered, they marched down Milk Street all the way down to uh, Griffin's Wharf. Griffin's Wharf. The three ships were, were in the water, obviously. Um, so about 50 men um, approached each ship, because they're about 150 men, so 50 men per ship. Now what they did was, they did not, 
They didn't loot any of the stores. They didn't loot any businesses. They didn't attack anybody. When they got to the ships, they took, there were about 342 chests of tea. And all they did was they destroyed the tea. And that's it. They dumped the tea into the harbor. They cleaned the ships, gave the keys back to the captains, and left. No one was hurt. There was no other damage done. The only damage was the tea was in the water. You know, this is the perfect time to have another sip here. <clears throat> so, nothing else was damaged. It was just the tea, that, and that's it. Now, granted, there were some people who were quite upset by this. Uh, George Washington wasn't too happy about it. Benjamin Franklin wasn't too happy about this because they felt like this wasn't really helping their case. But uh, John Adams, um, the future president, Sam Adams, um, several of the men uh, with the Sons, of, well, the Sons of Liberty in general, uh, the men of Virginia were Patrick Henry. They were all thrilled about what had happened. Um, the British did retaliate the coercive acts which then led to the First Continental Congress, and uh, martial law was imposed on Massachusetts after that. But that's, that's a whole new story. There was fighting eventually at Lexington and Concord, and that was in April, of, uh, 17, April 19 of 1775. That's, that's going to be kind of a, a whole different story. That would be more of... Uh, a history of the of the Revolutionary War itself. But what I'm trying to get at is, is that the Sons of Liberty did not destroy any buildings or businesses or killed any horses or anything of the sort. They demonstrated. They, they would start at, there was a Liberty tree that was kind of due south of, the, of uh, the Old South Meeting House. The Liberty tree was cut down. Now, there were two gangs, the North End and the South End gang, they were very destructive. They did ransack um, Andrew Oliver's house, and they also ransacked Thomas Hutchinson's house in 1765. But they were not, until later on, that was, it was not the Sons of Liberty that destroyed their homes. It was the North End and the South End gangs um, who participated in that. Sam Adams eventually controlled the North End and the South End gangs. They used to have something called the Pope's Night or the Guy Fox. Uh, festival. It was a very anti-Catholic festival on November the 5th. But again, the Sons of Liberty, Samuel Adams especially, kind of controlled them. And anytime that there was some sort of a problem, like during the Boston Massacre, it was the Sons of Liberty that would try to control the people. They couldn't control the mob all the time. It was very difficult for them because they didn't, there weren't enough Sons of Liberty's members to control all the mobs. So if somebody says to you, well, you know, they did destroy Hutchinson's home and Oliver's home, that was really the Boston Gangs. That was not the Sons of Liberty. So now you kind of get a gist of what I'm trying to get at. You know, there's a difference between peaceful protests and looting and anarchy. So, all right, let's go on to the next one. Let me see what we have here. Okay, well, this is... This is something else which I, I do want to kind of point out until, uh, about later on. Now, the First Amendment. Now, why did we have the First Amendment? Yeah. Let's put that there. Now, why do we have the First Amendment? The First Amendment, you can thank a guy by the name of John Locke. Our rights are protected by the Bill of Rights. Now, these rights are what we would call inalienable natural rights, God-given rights. The Bill of Rights was not created to grant us rights. The Bill of Rights was created to protect our rights. It was a contract between the government and the people. It put a muzzle on the government, not the people. The Bill of Rights in the Constitution was the contract that stated, we will protect your rights. That's our job, is to protect your rights, which we did not give you because if the government giveth, the government can take it away. It was, we will protect your natural, God-given, inalienable rights. That is what the Bill of Rights is. Now, you can thank a guy by the name of John Locke. He, he had much to do with it. Uh, John Locke um, had a huge influence on the English Bill of Rights, 1689. Um, it had to be signed by William and Mary before they could become the king and queen. And 
and they signed it, and it was the inspiration for men like John Adams and many others, Patrick Henry. Uh, they would look to John Adams, uh, I'm sorry, they would look to John Locke and say, this is who we need to emulate, and many of the rights that you will see in the English Bill of Rights were put in the, in the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. Now, we, when we signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, we were not a republic, we were a confederacy. Uh, the Articles of Confederation was what was kind of the law of the land, but it was a very weak um, law. It, it was a, the Articles of Confederation were very weak. They were, they were made that way because all 13 colonies, which now became states, were kind of like 13 separate countries. They had their own religion, their own established religion, their own established church. They had their own cultures. So they were not too keen on giving all this power to one federal government. Well, events such as Shays' Rebellion and the lack of taxation, you know, because the United States was under heavy debt after the Revolutionary War. We owed France a lot of money. France, Spain, we owed a lot of people. Uh, Holland, we owed them a lot of money because they, you know, we borrowed money from them for the Revolutionary War. Well, we needed some sort of a system of taxation. The Articles of Confederation couldn't do it. Shays' Rebellion proved that our government was too weak. So then we had a constitutional convention uh, in uh, May of uh, 1787 in Philadelphia. Uh, George Washington was the uh, presiding president. And around Septem September 17th, they finally had the, uh, the Constitution. Now, George Mason wouldn't sign the Constitution. He stated, he was from Virginia, George Mason stated that the, he was an anti-federalist. He felt that the Constitution gave the federal government too much power. Um, he was upset that slavery was maintained in the United States, and he was upset that there were no Bill of Rights. So he didn't sign it. He was one of three people who did not sign the Constitution. Now, there were Federalists and there were Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists were afraid that, there were, that the 13 states were now um, giving too much power to a federal government. Um, they felt like they were going to lose their autonomy, that, it, that being called a state is in name only, that all the laws are going to be coming from the federal government. So the Federalists had to appease the Anti-Federalists in some way. So George Mason's Bill of Rights was one of the ways that they did it. Now, Alexander Hamilton, he didn't think that a Bill of Rights was necessary. Uh, James Madison, um, he, you know, he ran against uh, James Monroe, who was, James Madison was our fourth president. His successor was James, J James Madison was the fourth, uh, Monroe was the fifth. Now, Madison and Monroe were friends, and what had happened was that Madison had promised that we would have some sort of a Bill of Rights that we would add to the Constitution. Now, the Constitution was ratified in 1788, and it was enforced in 1789, which was the first year that George Washington took the oath of office. So, um, James Madison introduced the Bill of Rights. Now, he and Roger Sherman were part of a committee um, to draft the Bill of Rights. Now, the House introduced 17 amendments, the Senate introduced 12 amendments, and then they they sent it to the states to ratify. Now, two of the amendments, the first and the second, uh, were not ratified. Now, ironically, the second amendment was ratified in 1993. 1993, so we're talking over 200 years, about 203 years, something like that, 204 years. That was the second amendment. The third amendment was what we call the first amendment. So the states ratified the third through the twelfth amendments. So now the third becomes the first, the twelfth becomes the tenth. So you have ten amendments. That's how we ended up getting the uh, ten amendments added to the Constitution. You can thank George Mason. He was the he was really the man behind it. And then you know, like I said, um, James Madison and Roger Sherman. Now let's talk about what is going on today. We have people who are rightfully upset about what is going on. You know, I've spoken to um, many black men and asked them, how do you feel about being black in America? And some of them have stated, look, 
I don't know anything else. I'm an American. And, but he feels like when he's driving, this is, this is one example. He says that when he feels like driving, he feels like the cops are just following him. I've had other black men say the same exact thing, exactly the same thing. And they would even tell me that we have to tell our kids if a cop, if a cop pulls you over, do what he says, do not resist. Just, you got to listen to that. Now, I have a lot of friends who are cops. Now, I'm not suggesting that all, cop, all cops are bad. I'm not. What I'm suggesting is that there are, just like, you know, any other group where you're going to have assholes, you're going to have a small percentage who makes it, who ruins it for everybody else. Um, what happened the other day with George Floyd? Those cops do need to be prosecuted. There, no, no doubt about it. They need to be prosecuted. He, he, was, he was stating, look, you know, he's like, I can't breathe. And the man died. And, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate we can't bring him back. But I'm going to state this. Now I'm going to get into the opinion portion of this. Just, we cannot judge every policeman for the actions of a few. Just like we cannot judge you know, with all the demonstrations that are going on, there's a tiny, tiny few that are doing the looting. There's a tiny, tiny few that are doing the destruction. Now, you know, they say that there's like three types of people that are a part of this demonstration. There's the peaceful protesters who are a vast majority. Then you're going to have some of the looters who are opportunists. And then you're going to have some anarchists. And these anarchists are the ones that are creating a lot of the devastation and destruction. And they're the looters and the anarchists are ruining it for the peaceful demonstrators. The peaceful demonstrators are trying to send a message. And rightfully so. And it's their God-given right to demonstrate. And we should, we should support them in their demonstration, as long as it's a peaceful demonstration. Now, if you want to compare apples to apples in terms of, like, the Revolutionary War, one can say that... When those, when those three cops were on top of George Floyd, you can justify, I'm going to say this, if it was me and I saw something like that, you can justify knocking the cops off the guy. If you see that they're snuffing the life out of a person, I can, I can, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying I can see how people can, can do that. Because, you know, look, just because they're the police doesn't mean that they're infallible. It doesn't mean that they walk on water. If we see something wrong, we have to do something about it. If the people push the cops off the guy, just to put a stop to it, to put a stop to the guy's agony, okay, and then stop there, and just stop there. Now, okay, if someone's pissed off and they burn the car, okay, I'm not justifying it, I'm just saying it's, it's like the Gatsby. You let a court decide on that one. But if the people, the people, if they just knock the guy off to put an end to it, you know, like if you have a concealed carry, you can use deadly force to put a stop to a crime. But then you cannot continue. Once the crime stops, you cannot continue and chase the guy and gun him down. It's not how it works. It's the same thing if, you, if uh, demonstrators see or, or witnesses see an act such as the, the police snuffing the life out of a guy such as George Floyd. Um, all the other police who have been, there have been, there have been police who have been beaten, there have been police who were hit with vehicles. No, that's, that's not a protection on the First Amendment. The anarchists, Antifa, and any other agent provocateur who are showing up to create some sort of a race war between the blacks and the whites, that is not protected free speech. Free speech are the ones that are marching, even with the bullhorns, with the signs. That's free speech that is protected by the First Amendment, a peaceably, peaceable demonstration. It's what the Founding Fathers were for. It's what the Sons of Liberty did. The Sons of Liberty did boycotts. The Sons of Liberty did marches. The Sons of Liberty did not attack innocent shop owners. They did not, even after the Boston Massacre, the Boston Massacre those redcoats who were arrested were put on trial. They had their day in court. Even though everybody knew that they were guilty, they were, put in, they, they were locked up. John Adams 
and Josiah Quincy. Josiah Quincy was the son of liberty. Josiah Quincy and John Adams were both patriots. They defended the Redcoats from the Boston Massacre. Now, that was 1770. The, the policemen need their day in court. But you don't go and attack innocent policemen. I want to show you... This is a statistic that I found. Now, these are the number of people shot by... shot to death. Ah, see, this is why I don't like this. Okay, I'm going to pause it. This is why you need to have somebody here assist me one of these days. Okay, so now these are the number of people who were killed by the police. This is uh, 2020, 1918. So in 2017, there were 457 um, white people shot to death by police in the United States. In that same period, there are 223. For Hispanics, 179, other 44, and unknown, 84. Now, for the following year, it uh, dropped for... For everybody, it looked like. Uh, 399 whites were shot by police. The year after, 370 whites were shot by police. Now, this is in March. So far in March, 42 white people have been shot by police. 31 black men have been shot to death by police. Now, these are the numbers, 223, 209, and 235, respectively, for 2017, 18, 19, and 20. Hispanics, 179, 148, 158. Other, 44, 36, 39, and unknown. Again, you have 84... Um, 84 in 28, 2017, 204 in 2018, 202, and this year 139. All right, so the question is going to be this. We know that there's going to be cops who are going to be... There are a lot of cops who kill people, okay? We, we understand that. But is it because they're racial or is it because they're assholes? I mean, Jesus of Nazareth... His 12 apostles, he had a guy who turned on him, Judas. In a country of 330 million people, we are going to have assholes in this country who are going to hate you because of the color of your skin or because of your religion. It's just going to happen. Yeah, I've been followed by cops. Is it because they're racial or is it because some of them are just assholes? I don't know. I'm not a sociologist. What I'm trying to do is, I'm not trying to answer that question, I'm trying to show you the difference between the looting of today and what went on with the Sons of Liberty and the American Revolution back in the 1770s. I, I hope that this will kind of give you an idea that this is, this is a problem, it needs to be addressed. When, when so many black men that I've spoken to have this natural fear of the police, we got to listen to that. There's something to it. There is something behind it, and it needs to be addressed. It, it must be addressed. This cannot continue. Peaceful demonstrations is the way that, that we want to go. Now, I had this earlier picture. I want to show you something here. This is on 9-11. You have blacks, whites. You have Asians. You have uh, Far East. You have uh, Asians here, Central Asians, uh, Latinos. We're all in this together. You know, we may have come... We may come here different ways, different ships, slave ships, cruise ships, whatever, on a jet plane, whatever, but we're all in the same boat. So we're going to have to learn to live together. If we don't learn to live together, uh, we're going to die together. So we've got to talk. We have to sit down. I want to introduce oh, a couple of books that I think that you should read, Federalist Papers. And if you can, John Locke. Now, the, I've got two different books on John Locke. Um, very important. John Locke's a very good person to read about. Now, last week, I introduced these two books uh, from the Library of America, uh, The Debate on the Constitution. You have part one and two. You have the writings of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Very good books. Great source of information. All right, now, I hope this helped. Again, I know this is a very controversial subject, but it's very important that, uh, that we have this type of discussion. Next week, we're going to talk about another aspect of the First Amendment, which is the, religious, the religion part, the uh, separation of church and state. I hope, that these, I hope that this series will teach you not to judge a book by the cover, or by its cover, rather.
okay? Black book. We need to find a way to get along together. I hope you enjoyed this. Please leave a comment. Now, this... I'm also, like I said, I'm with the Sons of History. We are going to be having a discussion on uh, much of the police brutality. Again, listen, it's a small minority. Just like it's a small minority of the demonstrators who are doing the looting, it's a small minority of police. I, I have friends who are police. They are not like they're being described by some of these guys in the media. The 24-7 news cycle constantly, constantly, constantly harping what is going on. It's not helping the situation. We all need to find a way to get to to just work together. You know, 9-11, they didn't care who we were. They didn't care if you were white or black. They just cared that you were an American and they wanted to kill you. We we're all in this together. Okay, I hope I covered everything. I'm Alan Joaquin with the Sons of History. Thank you for being a part of the Tuesday Night History Live, and I hope to see you next Tuesday. Thank you and God bless.